Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second part of our Chilean virtual wine tasting with Great Wine Online and Bodegas Volcanes. I'm Penny Hayes, as most of you will remember from last week, and I'm here today with Ben Gordon, and I have a new colleague who's joined us today, Steve Parker. Steve will be talking to us about some food pairings this evening, and hopefully we'll be doing a, a food pairing session with Steve in the near future. So welcome, Steve. Nice to have you with us tonight. Thank you. And welcome back, Ben, of Bodegas Volcanes. What's the weather like in Hi Chile there, today? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, very well. Another beautiful day here, so I can't complain. Good to see everyone again. Yes, you too. Let me just admit a couple of other people who are just joining us. So um, just to recap on what you were telling us about last week and the um, some of the uh, particular specific char characteristics of the area that you're in and the vineyards, volcanic soil, very good for grapes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, as, as the name would suggest, uh, for those that perhaps weren't weren't there last week or maybe weren't paying attention, hopefully everyone was. Um, <laughs> Bodega Volcanes, yeah, so uh, Spanish word uh, Volcanes, Volcanoes. Um, as I mentioned, Chile an incredibly seismic and volcanic country. And uh, we're very fortunate that we actually have access to fruit uh, across different uh, valleys. Um, so we already tasted a few wines last week from uh, Maipo, for example, for the Cabernet. Um, we also tasted a blend that was actually from three different areas. Um, and then we did the Chardonnay, which is from Mayeco in the south. Um, and today we're going to go to three different valleys again. Um, so uh, in each of those, I'll give you a little bit of an idea of, of kind of what is the volcanic influence, whether it's extreme or, or less extreme, and whether it's directly from eruptions or not, like I did last week. Um, but yeah, that's what we're about, looking for those wines with volcanic character, uh, and always with a, something a little different uh, to offer than just your sort of standard fruity New World wine. Great. And if anybody's got any questions, if they'd like to type those into the chat function uh, as we go through, and we'll ask them um, all of those questions as we go along. But then at the end, we'll open up um, everybody's microphone and uh, we can have a, a general chit chat. So what should we start with, Steve? Presumably the white tonight. Steve, sorry, Ben. Presumably yeah, with the uh, white. Absolutely. <laughs> now, no, no, I'm absolutely. So... Everyone has uh, the Sauvignon Blanc, I believe. Uh, again, so here today we'll be doing two wines from the Tectonia range, which is the same range of the three wines we tasted last week. Um, and then we will finish with Parinacotta, which is a, a blend, uh, a slightly more premium uh, red wine blend. So yeah, if everyone starts uh, with uh, the Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so here we are actually in an area called Leda. Um, some people might also have heard of an area called San Antonio with, uh, within Chile. So this is very much a coastal area. Um, so here, this is less volcanic, for example, than Maipo, where we were last week, which is very close to the, to the volcanoes. Here, the influence is much more uh, further down. It's much more embedded uh, within the, uh, the substrata of the soil uh, type itself. Um, and actually here, the proximity to the ocean is also incredibly important. So uh, for me, on a, on a personal level, if you speak to most Chilean winemakers, um, Sauvignon Blanc from and later is, is definitely the best area. So this is, this is the, the Sauvignon Blanc we'll be tasting. Um, and this particular vineyard, this estate, is when you're on the top of the brow of the hill within the vineyard, you can actually see the Pacific Ocean. So it's about five miles as the crow flies uh, from, the, from the waves. Um, so real uh, uh, kind of Pacific influence, very misty mornings, never gets particularly warm. Uh, we have about three or four days of the year when it's above 25 degrees Celsius. So when you hear people talk about cool climate, um, sometimes they might still be in quite warm areas. This really is a cool climate. Like you wouldn't be able to grow um, anything bar Pinot Noir for reds uh, here. But you know, you couldn't grow Cabernet or Merlot or or, or any of the sort of richer full-bodied red wines here, and it's great for Sauvignon Blanc. Now, and first um, smell of this, it doesn't taste, it doesn't smell anything like a Sauvignon. I'm not a great New Zealand Sauvignon fan. Um, I find them too gooseberry, too, well, I was going to say cat's pee, but then I don't know really what that smells like, but presumably not very nice. But this does not smell at all to me like a Sauvignon, not even a French one. No, I think... Yeah, I think, I think it's quite interesting, actually. Chile in general has, um, a lot of people say, quite an opportunity with, with Sauvignon Blanc. And again, definitely from later. Um, you know, some people might be, if you like, old world drinkers. So therefore, obviously, Loire, Loire Valley, predominantly in France, are famous for Sauvignon Blancs. They're quite austere. They're quite elegant. They're quite soft. 
Yeah. And then you do have on the other end of the spectrum what is particularly popular in the UK, um, you know, New Zealand and Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. Again, it's a, kind of a compound noun, uh, Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and that's what a lot of people will get if you ask for a buy the glass in, a, in, a, in an on-trade uh, in, in the UK. You will get naturally a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. And they can be quite pungent. They can be quite strong, quite um, in your face. Um, and they're very kind of easy to, to spot. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm promoting Chilean wine, so I, I, I've got to be careful. I don't want to be rude to New Zealand winemakers because I know I have a, good, a lot of friends making wine out there. But I do think a little bit more of a, a sort of uh, drinkability to the Chilean style uh, when you are potentially going into your second glass or even your second sip. Um, I love... New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, but I do find that after a little while, I get a little bit tired of it as a style. Yeah. Um, I struggle to, if I have a Sauvignon Blanc before I ha have a meal, sometimes I'm ready to move on to the next bottle of wine or the next glass of wine once I sit down with food. Whereas mm -hmm. I do think this Tectonia Sauvignon Blanc actually works beautifully or seamlessly. You'll kind of find, again, for us, the secret of a good wine is when you realize the bottle's empty and you've got to wonder whether to open another bottle. Mm -hmm. um, because balance and elegance here so it's not overly pungent it's quite elegant um, and it's quite soft in terms of the aromas and also you'll notice as well it's it's not obvious it's not like a oh yeah this is this is what I expect Sauvignon um, it's it's unexpected it's unusual it's almost honeyed in um certainly on the on the nose it's almost got a sort of a slight sweet honey taste honey smell yeah yeah absolutely and then yeah there's 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 a little bit of a barrel fermentation here, so that might be the, what's, what you're getting. And also as well, the other thing here, which is really interesting, you know, I mentioned last week a, a few sort of surprises, if you like. I guess it's not a surprise if you can read a label, uh, but this is, this is an old vintage for a Sauvignon Blanc. Everyone immediately thinks that Sauvignon Blanc should be, you know, 2019, 2020, and, and if it's any older than that, then surely I shouldn't be drinking it. It must be bad by now. Um, and what I love about showing this wine is actually it does show you that uh, if the wine is well made and if it's not sort of a cheap and cheerful style, uh, actually, you know, even Sauvignon Blanc can age beautifully. I mean, people, people know Chardonnay can and Great Burgundy. Uh, but actually, this Sauvignon Blanc is drinking really fresh uh, for a wine that's been in bottle for seven years. Um, and, and I think that's also why you're getting this evolution of these flavors that are a little bit more unusual as well. So certainly, I agree with you, a little bit of honeysuckle, uh, sort of floral elements, uh, rather than just a so this classic uh, Sauvignon Blanc uh, style to it. But still very fresh, um, which I should yeah. say for a seven-year-old um, Sauvignon is actually unusual. So yeah, it's bottling really well too. So Steve, what would you suggest we, um, we drink, we eat with this? Right, um, Sauvignon Blanc is one of those um, sort of fairly classic pairing combinations that people tend to know. They tend to know Sauvignon Blanc equals goat's cheese. And, and that sort of starts in the Loire Valley with Sancerre and the, those sort of Loire Valley goat's cheeses. As a principle, it's fine, but you do have to recommend, uh, recognise the geographical differences in Sauvignon Blancs. And what Ben's just described here, and my lovely wife just bought me some of, um, is, is something that's got a bit more depth, a bit more flavour, a bit more something about it than just acidity. And therefore you need, if you're going to have a goat's cheese with something like this, you need something that's got a little bit of age on it as well. If you can imagine there is such a thing as an aged goat's cheese. So you want to probably go for something that's got ash around it. Ash tends to be used on the outside of goat's cheese um, to, to help its ageing and stop a rind forming. Mm -hmm. And it means you just get that little bit more flavour with it. Um, I would suggest if you were buying cheese in England and you go to a really good cheese shop, something like Rachel would be incredible as a cheese. Um, if you happened to be in a supermarket buying your cheese, um, you can usually find a goat's cheddar. Um, there's one made by... Um, Ford Farm or Wookie Hole, same sort of same people, and the, they do a goat's cheddar. So it's something that's just got a bit more flavour and therefore matches with with the wine. The final recommendation I'd make here is one that's for those who like a little more guts in their cheese, which is an Alpine style cheese. So if you like a Comte or a Gruyere or an Emmental, something like that, absolutely delicious with this Sauvignon Blanc. Oh. Perfect. Yep. We happen to have a Comte in the fridge, so that's perfect for this evening. 
<laughs> I don't yeah, have any cheese. Like also and, in, and in chili, cheese is awful. You've oh, just really, really annoyed me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what would you eat with this then, Ben? And don't say clams with parmesan like last week. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, to be honest, um, I mean, for me, on a personal level, I love this without any, you know, on its own initially. I mean, I just think it's got so much depth to it. Um, but I, I kind of enjoy it just because it kind of constantly evolves with me. I don't feel like I need any kind of marriage with it. If I was going to be doing anything with it, then, you know, again, it's a bit of a classic, but, you know, ceviche is, is always great with Sauvignon. Um, and I think here, actually, you can be a little bit more outlandish and maybe have like a, a kind of more of a mixed seafood ceviche, something maybe even has a little bit of octopus rather than just a straight uh, kind of more regular salmon or sea bass ceviche. So it's got a little bit more meat, a little bit more flavor to it as well. We tried it last night, Penny, with a lemon hummus. Ooh. With some various things dipped into that. And that's really nice because you've got the creaminess of the hummus, but still got the sharp acidity of the lemon. Yes, because I was thinking creamy pastas as well would be quite yeah. would be quite interesting with creamy sauces or chicken with cream. Yeah. So yeah, fabulous. Great. That's yeah. really and I, and I think yeah, because of the style of it as well. I mean, some of the things and I mentioned some of those sort of dishes with the with the Chardonnay last week, and I think you know, here you've got, as I say, definitely a lot more depth than your average Sauvignon Blanc. And, uh, yep. you know, Chardonnay for me is like a more complex white, and I'm picking a little bit generally here. But one of the things that Sauvignon Blanc sometimes get a bad press for is being a little bit sort of mundane and lineal. And I think here, because it's a lot, got a sort of broader taste profile, you can definitely branch out and, and talk about sort of, you know, pasta dishes with a creamy sauce for sure as well with this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have to say, Ben, you promised us a surprise, and that one definitely has surprised me because, as I say, I'm not a great Sauvignon fan. So that very, very nice, very unusual, and I'm I'm really enjoying that. Thirty five, thirteen point five percent, so quite high yep. for a white. Again, we had this yep. conversation last week, but quite high high percentage for a white. Yeah, that is quite high, um, and actually, it's quite high even for for later. Um, here, again, definitely. This probably would be, if I recall this vintage, I think it's it's under 13.5. It's probably 13.2 roughly. Mm -hmm. So it could have been like 13%. Um, but again, we kind of, once we've had fa fairly consistent vintages at 13.5, we, we basically label everything there. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, this is a, this is cool climate. Um, so you wouldn't get anything above 13.5 um, without a doubt. And again, it's what we said earlier last week. You know, it's, for me, it's very important that there's balance. So if someone picks up a bottle of wine and goes, oh, hold on, this is 13.5, I'm not going to buy it. Sometimes you'll get less burn than a 12.5 badly made wine where you're just getting a lot of alcohol. So don't, you know, don't be scared necessarily um, by the alcohol percentage. Um, if it's a well-made wine, you shouldn't get the burn. Okay, no, that's great. I presume the next wine you're going to taste for this is the Pinot, Pinot Noir. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so we'll do the, the Tectonia Pinot Noir. Um, and interestingly enough, you've been talking about the climate here that you wouldn't have naturally assumed that Pinot would be coming out of Chile because, you know, Chile's a hot country, but clearly there are, um, it's a big country, so there clearly are some, some much cooler areas and clearly Pinot Noir is very much a cool climate wine. So again, a bit of a surprise yeah. that Pinot comes from Chile, but you'll explain why. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think actually it's, it's interesting you say that because I think Chile, you know, naturally is kind of much more known for sort of full-bodied reds, uh, you know, Cabernet, obviously, and now Cardamonair is its kind of signature grape. Um, but, it, but as you say, it's, it's an incredibly long, thin country. Um, you know, we're, we've tasted, we're going to be tasting six wines over the, over the two weeks uh, and tasting from six different valleys. And there's huge diversity in Chile. It's also been sort of one of the biggest um, kind of compli compli complex, uh, complex sort of situations for the marketing side of any Chilean winery and Chile as a, as a country, because how do you market diversity? You know, so you've got New Zealand, everyone knows New Zealand for Sauvignon Blanc and people know Otago for Pinot Noir, but no one will say, oh, I, I really want to get my Cabernet from New Zealand. It's very much a cool climate sort of uh, image. And then you've obviously got, you know, Bordeaux, you know, beyond France has obviously got centuries of history. So they're able to, to pinpoint their regions. And in Chile, the biggest challenge we have is actually showing people that you know, within Chile, we can make great wines from many different areas. Um, and here we're now going to about 400, 350 miles south of Santiago. So about 300 miles south of where the Sauvignon Blanc is from, to an area called Bio Bio for, for this Pinot Noir. Um, so this is just slightly north of the Chardonnay we taste last week. 
Um, one of the things I always point out with this wine, people see or hear the word BOBO, they think I'm talking about a biodynamic wine. Yes. Uh, that has nothing to do with it. It's the name of, the, of a river in, in Chile. It's actually the, the longest river in Chile. You can do a lot of whitewater rafting on this river. So it's a quite a, quite a fa fast flowing river. Um, and it's, uh, it gives its name to, to this particular region. And it's quite a new region in Chile. It was brought up by a fairly large uh, Chilean winery in the 90s, and they basically only planted Pinot Noir. So there was a huge kind of uh, burst of Pinot Noir, uh, kind of early 2000s uh, for, for Chile. Uh, and if you speak to a lot of uh, kind of esteemed viticulturalists or vineyard managers uh, globally, I think it's, uh, it's common knowledge that Pinot Noir needs to be old vines. So for me, the best is yet to come from, mm -hmm. from Chilean because it's still quite a young uh, young vineyard um, but I do like some of the styles that are coming out of it and this for me is, is a really interesting and beautiful style um, when we when we tasted last week if you remember I referred to the red blend as a crowd pleaser this for me is more of a room divider uh, this, well, this Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir tends to be a, a Marmite wine doesn't it it's either you like yeah, it or exactly. you hate it but this is yeah. a 2015 so um, they've, they've been you, you think it's probably got some 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 time to go? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we we this wine uh, the first vintage we made of it was two thousand uh, and eleven. Um, I fortunately drank a few of those bottles uh, as recently as probably a year or two ago. Um, they were still drinking pretty well. We reckon the aging on on these wines is is five to seven years. Uh, more than that, maybe not. Um, but yeah, definitely five to seven years is is no issue in terms of, of potentially aging this wine. Um, I'm always cautious to talk about aging wine because if you drink like I do um, you're doing well to hold on to bottles for five <laughs> to seven years um, but uh, yeah if you can well done good for you. Okay now my first impressions of this is that it's again not your typical Pinot Noir it, it smells like it's got age on it it yep. smells yep. not musty but slightly less fresh than, a, than, a, than, than an Definitely. average Pinot Noir. Yeah, and I, I think there's almost like a, maybe even a sort of gunpowdery or sort of smoky kind of real. Yeah. This is a wine that if, if I'm ever in a, in a big tasting uh, anywhere in the world and you sometimes get a sort of a journalist who might come to your table and he says, look, I've only got time for one wine. You're called Volcanes, which is your most volcanic wine. This is the wine I'll give them. Why? Because it's it's really is got this sort of smoky element to it. Um, yeah, ash. This, this, is, this is definitely uh, very much terroir driven. Um, our winemaker struggles to explain why she gets this taste profile. She doesn't do anything magic uh, in the winery. Um, and it's, it's also actually got quite, quite sort of uh, strong, firm tannins for a Pinot as well. Pinot, you know, most people uh, expect to be quite light and delicate, mm -hmm. but there's an animalistic sort of side to this wine as well on, on the palate. It's quite, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy, soft, uh, necessarily polished Pinot. It's a little bit more kind of rough, um, but it's, for, for me, what I love about it is, is that character. You know, it really does, uh, it's got a lot of kind of vibrancy uh, to it as, as a wine as well. Mm. It's definitely more complex than other Pinots that I've tasted. Um, certainly, for example, I love um, the Tasmanian Pinots, but they tend to have a much lighter, fresher feel to them. This is mm -hmm. definitely more complex. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I think, you know, we're, we'll move, I'm sure we'll have some, some cheese ideas for this wine, but yeah, it, again, it, for us, the Tectonia line, I think I mentioned last week, I refer to it as our gastronomic uh, wines. You know, they are, they are wines that definitely leave you salivating. They, they sort of almost make you hungry um, because your senses are very much pricked by the, the kind of acidity, the freshness, the complexity, and the taste profile of the wines. Um, and this wine for me really does, you know, it's, uh, trust me, I have tried to drink a bottle on its on on its own, and I have succeeded <laughs> on an occasion. But it is also a wine that I think I would recommend, you know, really with some food, um, because I think it, it marries really beautifully with with actually quite a whole a whole range of flavours. Um, yeah. Well, you'd normally drink Pinot Noir with something like pork, or um, you know, obviously salami is that sort of thing. So, Steve, yeah. what would be one of your recommendations for this particular Pinot Noir, but for Pinot Noir generally? Um, building on what Ben said, there's a, there's an awful lot of Pinot Noirs in, in, in the market that tend to be what I'd call like a soft drink, and then you get the ones that are Pinot Noir with attitude, like this. 
Um, and, and this is what I, this to my mind is quite a funky wine. And therefore, if I'm thinking of food, I, I'm thinking of quite funky flavours. Um, and by funky, I, I mean it fills your mouth and your brain and your nose. I don't mean some sort of 1970s disco thing. Um, and uh, so if I was sticking in the world of cheese, I would, um, although Penny and I haven't re rehearsed this, I would say the Alpine cheeses would be great again um, with this. And they, they always go well with Pinots. But I think what this wine is really made for is those lovely Burgundian style, smelly washed rind cheeses. So whether it be Longre that some of you may know, or Epoisse, um, or Munster, the, these sort of say Burgundy, Alsace style cheeses. If you were looking to Britain, you Stinker Bishop is probably the, the most famous. Um, or you get Roll Wright from Oxfordshire. Uh, looks like Roger knows that one. <laughs> See a smile there. Um, so you get Roll Wright from Oxfordshire, or you get Rob Lachon from the Savoir. So basically, any cheese that's been washed in salt water or alcohol, which will always end up with a pinky, orangey, soft, sticky rind on the outside. That's the clue that you're looking for. Um, the sort of thing that starts to creep off the cheese board after about half an hour. Oh. Um, that's what I would definitely be having with this. And the thing is, because you've got quite a powerful cheese there and a wine that's got some real attitude, ideal for putting some gherkins with it, some little bits of saucisson, that sort of thing. And, you know, you, you've got supper sorted there. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that, Stephen. I, <laughs> I actually refer to this wine as, as my nibbles wine. So um, I think it's, it really goes well. I'll tell you something, a kind of anecdote, but we do incredibly well uh, with this wine in Japan and Korea. Why do I explain, why do I mention that? Because if you think of how um, they eat over there, they don't have a plate with a steak on it. They actually have lots of little bowls with many different flavors uh, on them. Um, so actually their food is incredibly complex and, and wine pairing in Asia is, is a whole different ball game. This would go um, nicely with kimchi actually. Yeah, with kimchi, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, if you have um, a complex sort of, you know, five or six different kind of small plates um, on a table that are ultimately your meal, uh, you have to find a, a wine that has this sort of breadth that is able to match pretty well with all of them. Uh, and this wine does really well in those markets. And, and then for me, who I don't tend to prepare much Korean food in my house, I'm more of a salami, saucisson and, and fine cheeses guy. Um, but you still have, you know, you can have on that sort of smorgasbord uh, lots of different flavors. And I think this wine goes beautifully with it. Um, and at the same time, it never, because it's Pinot, it will never dominate anything. It will always sort of just keep things under wraps. Because if you're, if you're forking out on some decent, uh, decent salami, some decent charcuterie and some decent cheese, you know, you want to taste them. Um, and, uh, and I think this wine is, is perfect kind of balanced in that respect. Very interesting. No, I, it, it's, again, it's a surprise because it's not like your classic Pinot. So um, yeah, you've, you've surprised us again. Ben with that one, it's fantastic. Now, Carignan. Carignan is definitely a Marmite wine. You either love it or hate it. And very <laughs> rarely do you see it on its own. You very rarely saw it on its own. It seems to be in some parts of France now becoming a little bit more um, popular as a, as a single varietal. But you've, um, you've blended it, well, you've blended it into Syrah. So Syrah is the, um, obviously the, the predominant grape in the last wine that we're going to, take, to taste. But tell yeah. us why Carignan. So um, this is this interesting. So this is actually the, the first wine uh, Pilar, our winemaker, ever made. So so if you like Volcanis as a project, it was always this idea to be a little bit more premium, to really kind of find wines that express uh, this volcanic terroir. Um, so obviously, you know, we were looking to, to try and make a wine that was different and, and really sort of stood out from, from the crowd. Um, and when Pilar first made this wine, she'd never worked with Carignan as a grape at all. So the first vintage she made was 90% uh, Syrah and 10% Carignan. Uh, when she first tasted uh, this, uh, it was the 2009 vintage in barrel, she thought she was going to get the sack because Carignan, uh, after about three or six months in barrel, is still absolutely animalistic. It's really, really strong. It's, it's, you know, it takes a long time to sort of calm a Carignan down. Um, especially, you know, old vine Carignan. Here we're talking old vine, totally dry farmed, uh, Secano as we call it here, uh, Carignan. So really rich flavors. Um, over the years, she started to, to kind of understand how to tame this beast. 
And now, you know, we've, we've realized that 70-30 seems to be pretty much on the money in terms of, of how the blend works. Um, and, and I think it, it works beautifully. Why does it work beautifully for me? I think you actually get a real kind of beautiful juxtaposition of, of two quite different grapes. Um, Syrah, I would say, you know, kind of in some parts of the world has got a bit of a bad press because there was a bit of an overkill uh, by the Aussies with a lot of Syrah or Shiraz. Um, less so maybe in, in the UK, but in the US, you can't give Syrah away at the moment. Um, and, and yeah, at the same time, if you don't tell one someone it's Syrah, Syrah is really juicy, really approachable. And then you've got Carignan, which is, like I say, quite animalistic and quite rough and ready. And when you marry the two together, you get this really, really beautiful uh, blend. And I think here, what I said last week about the blend we had before, I love blends where you kind of see the label and you go, oh, wow, I can really taste these varietals and I can see how they're working together. Sure. Lost you then for a minute. Um, so yeah, I just got an internet connection issue. Did you hear me? Yeah, sorry, we lost you there for a bit. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I'm back. Um, one thing, very interestingly, there was an article in um, online this week that was talking about some of the myths around wine, and it was talking about heavy, beautiful bottles with deep divots are just a this fake they don't mean anything but actually i don't think that's true <laughs> so you'll explain why this bottle is so beautiful so heavy um and why the divot because the big divot because of, you know it is a beautiful bottle it looks fantastic the label's fantastic it it smacks of rich expensive wine yeah i i think i think the the key there as well is is uh Ultimately, you need to look at certain price points. If this bottle uh, was on a supermarket shelf for five pounds, then in the context of if you break down the costs that go into producing a wine, the two most expensive components are the wine itself and the glass. So if you have a five pound bottle of wine with an incredibly expensive bottle, that doesn't leave much room for the wine itself. The wine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I think it, it's, is if, if a premium wine um, is, is in an expensive bottle, but it's also priced quite expensive, or, you know, it's a quite an expensive wine, you actually have a little bit of margin where you should, and you can uh, obviously uh, allow your wine to be in a better, bo a better bottle. Um, and then also it goes back to what, what sort of I mentioned last week. We're in 30 markets, and in some markets, we, we talked about screw cap and cork last week. In some markets, if I was to be very ecological and say, oh, I'm going to put this in a flat a uh, very lightweight glass bottle for, for however fantastic the wine and even the label may be, I can assure you most Asians won't touch it with a barge ball. So I have to be commercial as well in terms of uh, how, I, how I kind of bottle my wines. And we bottle this once a year, each vintage, and we leave it for, for 12 to 18 months to, to age. And I'm certainly not going to do an ecological bottle version for some markets and a non-ecological for the Asians. So, you know, we have to be realistic there. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting one. You get uh, they get a bit of bad press the the big bottles, and you know we do have, uh, you know we we're, we're kind of I'm not sure if we're proud of the, the big bottle. It's not something we market, but we recognise that it's a, it's a need be in in certain markets, so we don't hide it. No, it looks perfect. And tell us a little bit about the Parinacotta uh, label that you've got on here, limited edition, slightly different brand. Yeah, so the one you had so Paranacotta is is the name of a volcano up in the north of Chile so this is actually um, it's if you if you google uh, Paranacotta you will find these mesmeric uh, photos online of this beautiful uh, kind of conical snow-capped volcano up in the north of Chile so it's actually the volcano that we use for all of our uh, our branding um, and kind of we enhance it closer and closer each time so if you do have the Tectonia and the Paranacotta label, you'll actually notice that the kind of the basis of the of the images is actually the same. But here now, because this is Paranacotta itself, we're actually kind of enhancing the image a little bit more. And you'll also notice that there's a, a second uh, volcano uh, in the background on the Paranacotta label. Um, and there's actually, there are two volcanoes here that actually kind of uh, smoke or erupt at the same time. Uh, and the indigenous tribes talk about Romeo and Juliet's story because of the, the fact that they will always uh, kind of fumarole or have the smoke rings at the same time. Um, so yeah, this is, as I say, one of the, one of the tallest uh, volcanoes in, in Chile, uh, snow-capped. 
stunning and you know ultimately great great for marketing and it's it's also pronounceable as well there are others that are, are less pronounceable that we wouldn't use on our labels I feel like the i sound it one we had a few years ago with the problems with okay right the, yeah, well, the, 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 the tallest volcano in Chile is, is called Ojos del Salado, which means salty eyes. And I'm not sure how much of a marketing tool that would be. No, no, no. You're right. Absolutely right. Stick with pan pa Paranacota. <laughs> wow. This is incredibly deep red. It's absolutely beautiful color. Absolutely beautiful color. Really yeah. dense. Yeah, so you maybe recall I said it towards the end of uh, the tasting last week that you you would hopefully kind of feel this idea of of almost being taken away from what you expect of, of chili. So so when I mentioned earlier that for me the Pinot Noir is the wine that I chose when they say, uh, you know, show me your most volcanic kind of expressive wine. And then if I get someone who just says, surprise me, surprise me with something. Um, uh, or, you know, or someone who even wants to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm the best blind taster in the world. I can tell you where a wine comes from and, and what's, it, what's its composition. Uh, I show them this wine because um, a lot of people don't place it as Chilean. Um, certainly, it's, it's not necessarily easy to, to, to spot the kind of the Syrah Carignan. Um, but I think it's, it drinks beautifully. It's got a sort of Mediterranean or Italian kind of esque to it. Got quite a lot of structure and almost I call a backbone to the wine. But it's still got this lovely kind of fruitiness that you expect from the new world as well. So it's a really nice kind of balance. Very subtle on the nose. Mm. And Carignan's quite, you know, quite aromatic in terms of, you know, get a lot of kind of floral aromas, uh, not dissimilar in some of the kind of uh, uh, aromas uh, to, to Malbec. So you get a little bit of violet. Um, and I think that comes through a little bit on the, on the nose as well. But again, this lovely acidity. What's nice about this is it <clears throat> the spiciness of the syrup has been sort of calmed down, I think, by the carignan in this one. This is very nice. Mm. What did you say? It was 30% carignan, 70% syrup. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> mm. So, Steve, what would I put this with? Before we go on to that, we were talking about bottles just now. And there's I'm one of these people that clicks bizarre facts about wine just want to share this with you the reason that we have a 750 ml bottle is very simple but one that people don't think about very often 750 mils was the capacity of the average human's lungs so when the bottles were blown by mouth when if you gave it a full puff of your lungs you'd get to about 750 mils so that's how we ended up with that bottle size Okay, that is the most absurd fact I've heard in a long, long time. But so thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> it is true. I'm going to be using that. That is awesome. It's fantastic. It is, it is absolutely true. God knows who invented the Magnum. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anyway, um, what would I eat with Paranacotta? Um, do you know what? I would pair with Paranacotta another bottle of Paranacotta and a good mate. Um, it, it, doesn't it doesn't need food it is really food good. helps it there's no doubt about it um it's one of those wines i could drink all day long but if i was drinking um or, or eating a cheese with this i would go for a hard sheep's cheese um there are some styles of hard sheep's cheese which people know but don't necessarily know that they're sheep's cheeses uh possibly the most famous ones are manchego from spain perfect um, Pecorino from Italy or Osso Irati from southwestern France down in the Pyrenees. Um, th there's a sort of symbiosis here that sheep's cheeses are generally made in mountainous regions mm -hmm. um, and obviously the wine has a mountainous pedigree here mm -hmm. so, so this that, that sort of quite appeals to me that that synergy. Um, but the, the lanolin that you get within a hard sheep's cheese and the bite you get with it, I think matches the profile of the wine quite deliciously. Yeah. So that's what I'd go for, a hard sheep's cheese. Um, like we said on the previous um, wine as well, though, with the Pinot Noir, feel free to pair it with anything you want that's got a bit of bite, bit of um, tanginess to it as well, because the Carignan will carry a lot of foods and and so if you like something with a bit of spice 
bit of chili, bit of garlic, no problem at all with this wine. No, that's great because because actually spicy food is is quite difficult. When we tend to drink something like a Gewurztraminer, if it's a a Thai curry or something like that, but I can imagine this actually going really well with a a strong beef type curry, something like that. Yeah, I, it would probably go better with a rendang, um, that that style of curry, if you like, rather than the more elegant, delicate sort of Thai curries. Yeah, yeah, okay. so. interesting. Now, um, well, Sarah's saying she loves all the cheese suggestions. She's also asking how long will these wines drink for? I think we, we said uh, last week that open, they'll, they'll keep for a good couple of days, but I don't think that's what she means. I think what she means is how long can we keep them for? Although clearly they're all open now, so we need to drink them quick. But um, we need to probably lay some of these down. I mean, the white, for example, you've already said is seven years. Will that yep. lay down for any length of time? The Sauvignon Blanc, um, if I'm honest, I reckon it's, you know, it, in, a, in, a, in a positive way, is on its last legs. I think, you know, it's probably only got another year kind of where it's still going to be drinking with that freshness and that acidity. Yeah. And I think you will start to get the, within a year's time, a little bit more of the tiredness and you'll get acidity, but you'll get no flavour to back it up. So it will start to become a little bit unbalanced after a while. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would suggest, uh, you know, the Sauvignon Blanc, you know, there's no need to hang on to that any longer. Um but I, I, I'm impressed with the freshness that it has right now. The, the Pinot Noir, um, again, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we, we believe, and based on previous vintages, that five to seven years is, 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 is decent drinking for that. Um, and the Parinot um, you know, definitely has 10 years of aging potential and maybe even a little bit more. Right. And then just in terms of some of the things we mentioned last week, and, and I think um, uh, we, we sort of discussed about, you know, just whether they need to be drunk immediately now in terms of once you'd open them. The Paranicotta, um, you can enjoy for three, four days. Um, I don't think there'll be any issues there. Uh, again, the challenge is whether you can hold on to the bottle for that long. Uh, the Sauvignon Blanc, I think, you know, again, being a white um, and maybe even slightly more delicate and aged than the Chardonnay we had last week, um, we'll be drinking fine tomorrow, but you will notice that a little bit more muted with the, the fruit. And the Pinot Noir will drink very well tomorrow. We'll still be showing a lot of uh, exuberance, um, but probably on day three, we'll probably be not as good as, say, day, day one or two. Um, but yeah, the, the Paranicotta will be better probably tomorrow. Well, Rogers just said that, that last week, um, one of the wines that he opened was actually left um, for 24 hours and he enjoyed it more. And I've, I've found that sometimes with some wines, it's actually they're better the following day, especially if they're slightly musty. So I think they allow, my father used to say, let the stink out of the bottle. And, you know, I, yeah. I get that because sometimes the wine actually tastes better the following day. And that's clearly what's happened with them, um, with whatever, whichever red it was, Roger, that you had last week that you thought was, thought was better on the second, 24 hours later. I can't yeah, hear yeah, you. The, I'll ask you in a minute. The, the red blend or the cabinet, yeah. <laughs> and Alison is saying, Alison Fitzgerald is saying three to four days, very unlikely to happen. Well, yeah, in this house too. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. That's fantastic. These, these have been amazing wines. I mean, totally different to what we had last week, but absolutely. Yeah, surprising. I think a little bit more, a little bit more eclectic, perhaps. Like last week, I think there was, it was maybe a little easier to draw a line between them, like in terms of, okay, I kind of, uh, uh, I can sense, you know, that this, I think hopefully you can still sense the sign, the, the idea of the winery. You know, we're still trying to produce the wines that are different, that have this to them that I mentioned last week in terms of the volcanology. But I think here you've got a, you know, a little bit more uh, wines that sort of really kind of jump out and go, wow, this isn't what I expected, either from the varietal or from Chile. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's what made it really interesting today. I think that's what's nice about um, this is, is, is what we recognise as, you know, great varieties such as Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir, but then they're just different. Syrah, Carignan, mm, not something I would have come necessarily thought of as a pairing, really, really interesting. So I think that's what I'm liking about um, these tastings we're doing is that we're actually finding unusual things uh, and different grape varieties to perhaps um, try. Certainly some yeah. of these I wouldn't necessarily have thought of as coming from Chile originally. So it's been really, really interesting. What I'd like to do is now is ask anybody you know, for, their, for their views really on, on what, um, what they've enjoyed about this, what they've enjoyed about uh, the whole process, but also if they've got any other questions. I'm going to try and figure out how I unmute you all. Um, I might have to do it all one by one. And any comments that any of you have got, just you know, please feel free. Ask any questions that you'd like to ask of, um, of Ben or Steve, for that matter. 
for messaging Alison. <laughs> Roger, you were you were you were wittering. <laughs> I, I'm really sorry, but we missed Steve Parker's introduction. Right, Steve, his work is is new to us. He's working with us now on wine and food pairing. In fact, he's written a very interesting book that we're going to be looking at on cheeses. Is it mainly on cheeses, Steve? Of food pairings, of wine pairings with cheese. Um, no, the book that's recently been uh, published is actually about cheese on toast, not about <laughs> which, you know, hey, what better thing in the world to eat? But no, I'm currently writing a book about cheese and wine pairings, so you'll be pleased to know I do a lot of research in this field. What is not to like? That's fantastic. I love cheese. Yeah, no, absolutely. Tough thing to do research on. Yes. What's the name of the book? British Cheese on Toast. British oh, cheese on toast. By Steve Parker. We're going to put it up on our um, on our website, I think, because I think that would be a really good one. But I think, Steve, I would like to do a session with you on food and wine pairings. You know, just as that session, pleasure. so we'll get that organised because I think Absolutely that would be really good pleasure. fun. Perfect. Yeah. Well, yeah. Helen, who's on the call here, no, can I? Her, her and I have worked together and done some really fun tastings. We we did one um, last year on fish and chips and fizz. Which was which was That's a great true. evening. That we done like curry it. evening with wine, so we're, uh, wine and curry evening. Yep. Yeah. That's perfect. I think a wine and curry evening is a very good idea. Things that are doing really that tomorrow. Fun. Brilliant, Alison Fitzgerald. You were asking a question. Yeah, so, sorry, but signal. It was just a quick one about temperatures. I quite like a cool red. There's something that's served quite cool. Is there any of these that you would, and I'm going to come on to some others, but is there any that you would serve at a cooler temperature? No, re really good question. And I think I always get a, a little bit of a bee in my bonnet, actually, about temperatures in general. I think, you know, uh, Penny's kind of pointed out a lot of the wines in general, you know, the alcohol in, in, in Chile. And I think for, for Chilean wines and New World wines in general, um, I think 16 degrees is actually your optimum, rather than a lot of people say 16 to 18 for reds. I, uh, I kind of who I write the back labels for, for our wines and I always put 16. I don't put to 18 um, because I think that if you've got a high alcohol wine, you really want to keep them. I'd prefer them to be slightly chilled rather than over the limit because that's when you do naturally get, you know, the alcohol and the ethanol coming through. So, and then on these particular wines that the Pinot, Pinot is always an interesting one. You know, some people prefer them slightly more chilled. Um, I've tried this Pinot, you know, definitely kind of between and a red and white in terms of temperature. Uh, and it works really well. If you chill it a little bit too much, you find that it actually loses all of its fruit and you just get full on kind of smokiness, which is interesting, but it does make it a little bit aggressive to drink. You know, you need the, the freshness and the fruitiness to come through as well. So the, the Pinot, you could definitely chill a little bit, um, you know, throw it in the fridge for, for 20 minutes uh, before you're going you're gonna to drink it. Uh, and then Paranicotta, just make sure it's not too hot. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's really yeah, interesting yeah, here definitely. in Chile or around the world. People talk about serving wines at room temperature, which I, I don't particularly like because um, it's it's a oh. difficult wine. And I don't, but I, 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 I when I first uh, started dating my wife, my father-in-law was doing a barbecue for about sixty people, and it was about thirty-five degrees Celsius here in Chile, and I had all the red wines in ice, and he was looking at me saying, "What on earth are you doing? You know, no one puts red wine in ice here in Chile." Uh, he was delighted because everyone was so happy with the wines. He was slightly annoyed with me because he said never one, everyone drank way more wine than they would normally. <laughs> because it was fresh and very drinkable. So I, I won on one side but lost on the other. But yeah, it's true. I think, you know, if a wine is served at a bad temperature, it doesn't matter what it is, it's not going to be drinking very well. So it's very I think important. That, that's a classic. I mean, so many whites, especially in restaurants, are over-chilled. And of course, if you yeah. over-chill the white, you can't taste it. Yeah, so absolutely. if you've got a very bad yeah. white, then chill it to death and then you can't yeah. taste it. But if you've got a really good white, like we've got tonight, you know, you don't want it too cold because we won't no. be able to taste it. So I think you're absolutely, absolutely right. I mean, the Australians, I know, chill a lot of their Pinot Noir. Um, but, you know, it, and it tastes fine. But that's in, that's in the, the environment that you're in where it's hot. So, yes, I do get that um, chilled red wine to keep it at a reasonable temperature. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, yeah, like you say, you know, white wines, you know, should be served at six to eight degrees. Fridges at three or four degrees. So, you know, in an ideal world, you want to take it out, you know, and drink it five minutes later. So, you know, mm -hmm. even 
that. I'm not saying, you know, but, but actually you'll notice that your second glass of a white wine, if you just left it on the table in front of you, might be better and more, more enriching in yeah, that absolutely. first one where it's slightly sort of uh, under wraps uh, flavor wise. Yeah, definitely. No, that's great. Brilliant. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you everyone else for, for um, joining in. And um, we're looking at some more tastings in the future. Um, Helen and I have been talking about, a, and neither of us can say this, a Ribera del Duero um, yeah. tasting in Spain. So not the classic Rioja, yeah. but something slightly different from yeah. Spain. So we'll let you all know about that one because that will be coming up probably later in May. Um, love to get your feedback about these, these tastings. If there's anything else that you'd like us to do, slightly differently and I'm really hoping that one day soon we can all get together in the same room and actually taste some wines together because it's fun but it'd be much more fun if we were all together in one room so Penny, um, are, you, are you doing the next the, the first three next week again are you doing the part one again next we week? are yes Welcome. we are doing part one again and then we're doing it again the following week are you <laughs> part one again but then we're going to give Ben a break because we are going to do Spain, I think, on the 28th of May. Okay. We're just trying to figure that one out at the moment. Okay. But um, we've then got New Zealand, um, Argentina and sparkling. I want to do a sparkling one as well, which could be good fun. So um, and, and possibly even a rosé. Rosé gets a bit of a bad rep, so we might just do a rosé tasting as well. So we're working on all of these at the moment. So and we'll let you know all about them as, as and when. So thank you so much, everybody, for, um, for coming along. Thank think, you. Yeah, thanks, for everyone. Take a white and drink and, uh, that one tonight. Um, yeah. Keep the reds for tomorrow Enjoy night. the wines. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Just out of interest, Ben, what's the uh, COVID position in Chile? Um, yeah, so we're, it's, it's a strange one here. We're, we're what, what I would call in more of a voluntary lockdown rather than a, <laughs> than a, a state lockdown. So I've been I've been working from home and, and very much kind of uh, stuck at home for seven weeks. So pretty much same timelines to when kind of lockdown started in, in the UK. Um, but actually, I can I can leave my house if I want to uh, at any time and go wherever I want. Um, but most people, you know, sensibly are obviously you know, restricting their movement. Yeah, um, if they've recently started uh, kind of more specific uh, lockdowns in certain boroughs within the big city or within Santiago and a few uh, smaller cities uh, have actually had lockdowns as well so they're kind of trying to attack the pockets rather than just do a, a, a full lockdown mm -hmm. um, the, the biggest concern we have is that we're moving into into winter so here in in Chile there is every winter a huge number of respiratory disease issues because of smog um, so if that was to kind of coincide with the peak of uh, COVID, uh, then there could be some pretty serious issues. So people are, people are keeping themselves, you know, locked down and have done for seven weeks. The only concern is that winter's not even started. So if they ask us to lock down for another eight, Whoa. I'm not sure, you know, where we'll be um, in, in 15 weeks of, of lockdown. So yeah, we're, we're luckily that the figures look very good for Chile. You know, we've had very, very few deaths, which is ultimately the most important. Yeah. Um, and, and most people are respecting it. But I think it's like everywhere. After seven or eight weeks, you are starting to get a few people saying, well, hold on, I've been locked down for long enough. I, I've got a, a football team I play for and there's talk of some people wanting, wanting to play tomorrow night. I won't be one of them. But, you know, they're bored of mm. being stuck at home to play a five-a-side. Um, and that just, you know, that's an example, but it gives you an idea of a few people getting itchy feet. Well, it's BE Day here tomorrow. We were supposed to have a bank holiday. And... Um, Certainly, my, my mother's. You've got a bank holiday. Uh, it is a bank holiday, yeah. But my mother's road, my mother's road is having a street party, so everybody's going to bring their own scones and their own tea and put it at the end of their drives and have this hysterical street party. The same. Are you? We're having a picnic. I love it. Front, front gardens, yeah. That's exactly what they're going to do. So we've been colouring bunting and all that kind of stuff. So it should be good oh, yeah. fun. We'll have the bunting up. We've got to put our bunting up tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can take Fantastic. some great wines with you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. we, we want photos, Penny, if possible. Of, of Don't the you worry. We'll get, we'll get them. Parana cotta and scones. There we go. There you yeah. go. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's Pinot yeah. Noir tomorrow, isn't it? Cheese, cheese scones, you see. We'll have Steve's recipe for cheese scones. That'll be there great. you go. 
Perfect. Yes. Right, Steve, send it to me and I'll email it to everyone. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, it's been, a, been an absolute pleasure. I appreciate everyone for, for taking part. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been great fun. Thank you, Thanks, Penny. Thank you. Take yeah, care, thanks a lot, Penny. Appreciate it. Cheers, Thanks. Steve, as well. Thanks, Helen. Ben. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.